Hi, I'm Eva. Before I continue, please like and subscribe for more stories like mine. I never thought I'd be standing in an empty living room, the echoes of my family's laughter still lingering in the walls. But here I was, with a foreclosure notice in my hand and a heart full of betrayal. It all started on a seemingly ordinary Tuesday. David, my husband, had been laid off months ago. We were struggling, but we were a team, or so I thought. I was washing dishes, lost in thought about how we could stretch our meager budget, when I noticed David's unusually tense demeanor as he walked in. Eva, we need to talk, David said, his voice quivering slightly. I dried my hands, anxiety nodding in my stomach. What's wrong, David? You look like you've seen a ghost. He hesitated, then blurted out, I sold the house. The words hung in the air, unbelievable and cold. You sold our home? The home where we raised our kids? How could you? David's eyes were downcast. We were drowning in debt, Eva. Mr. Grayson, a businessman, offered a good price. It was the only way. I felt a rush of anger and disbelief. And you didn't think to discuss this with me? We built our life here, David. He sighed, a broken man. I thought I was protecting us. I remember standing in the living room, surrounded by boxes, when Mr. Grayson swaggered in. Well, well, the previous owners, he sneered. You should be grateful I offered such a good price. His arrogance boiled my blood. You're destroying our home for your condos, I spat. Grayson just laughed. It's just business, Mrs. Eva. Maybe you should teach your husband to make better decisions. As he left, the door slamming behind him, David tried to reach out to me. Eva, I'm so sorry. I thought, don't. I cut him off. We need to focus on finding a place to stay. We moved into a cramped, dingy apartment. I started picking up extra shifts at the diner. But David, he changed. The guilt seemed to consume him, turning him into a shadow of the man I married. He started coming home late, reeking of alcohol, a stark contrast to my long hours spent working and caring for our kids. One night, I confronted him. This isn't you, David. What's happening to us? David slumped on the couch, his face in his hands. I don't know who I am anymore, Eva. I've lost everything. I wanted to be angry, to scream and shout, but all I felt was an overwhelming sadness. We haven't lost everything, David. We still have each other, the kids. But as the days turned into weeks, David drifted further away, lost in his own world of regret and self-loathing. It was during this time that Lily, an old friend from high school, reached out. Eva, I heard about your situation. I run a community center and we're looking for someone to help out. Are you interested? Her offer was a lifeline. Yes, Lily, I am. Thank you. Working at the community center gave me a sense of purpose. I was helping people, making a difference. But at home, things were falling apart. David's behavior became increasingly erratic, and whispers of his involvement in shady deals began to surface. One evening, I sat down with him. David, what's going on? I hear rumors, and I'm worried. He avoided my gaze. It's nothing, Ava. Just trying to make some quick money to fix our situation. By getting involved with the wrong people? I was incredulous. You're risking our family's safety. David stood up abruptly. What do you want me to do, Ava? I've already ruined everything. I felt a strange mixture of relief and heartbreak. Relief that the cycle of lies and pain might finally be over. Heartbreak for the man I loved, who had lost himself to his mistakes. And so, with a heavy heart, I turned my back on the life we had built and stepped into an uncertain future, armed with nothing but hope and determination. Life, as I knew it, was spiraling downward faster than I could have ever imagined. Our new apartment felt like a cage, small and suffocating, a constant reminder of what we'd lost. The kids tried to adjust, but I could see the sadness in their eyes, the unspoken longing for the home they'd known. It was during these dark days that David's guilt began to consume him, he was a shell of the man I married, hollowed out by shame and regret. His presence in the apartment was like a ghost, there but not really there. One evening, as I was trying to make the best of our meager dinner, David sat across from me, his eyes vacant. Eva, he started, his voice barely above a whisper. I'm sorry. I never meant for any of this to happen. I looked at him, the anger in me battling with the remnants of the love I once felt. David... Your apologies can't change what's happened. We're here because of your decision. He nodded, 
tears brimming in his eyes. I know, and I'll never forgive myself for it. Then came the news that felt like a second betrayal. Mr. Grayson, the man who'd bought our home, was planning to tear it down. He wanted to build luxury condos, wiping away the only place our family had ever called home. The day I found out, I was at the community center, trying to lose myself in helping others. Lily, my friend who'd given me the job, found me staring blankly at the wall. Eva, what's wrong? She asked, concern etching her features. I shook my head, the bitterness in my voice surprising even me. Grayson is demolishing our house. He's erasing every memory we had. Lily put a comforting hand on my shoulder. I'm so sorry, Ava, but remember, you're making a difference here. You're helping people rebuild their lives. One day, a young woman came in, her eyes filled with the same despair I'd seen in my own reflection. Her story was heartbreakingly familiar. Her husband had left, and she was struggling to make ends meet. As I listened to her, something inside me clicked. I wasn't alone in my struggles. Listen, I said to her. I know it feels like the end of the world right now, but you're stronger than you think. You can get through this. She looked at me, hope flickering in her eyes. How can you be so sure? Because I'm going through it too, I replied. And if I can keep going, so can you. That night, I returned to the apartment to find David sitting in the dark, a bottle of cheap liquor in his hand. He looked up at me, his eyes bloodshot. Eva, I don't know how to fix this, he slurred, his words slurring together. I sighed, exhaustion weighing down every bone in my body. David, you need to get help. You're destroying yourself. He laughed bitterly, the sound echoing off the bare walls. Maybe I deserve to be destroyed. I didn't have the energy to argue. I left him there, in the darkness, and went to tuck the kids into bed. That night, I lay awake, listening to the sounds of the city outside, wondering how many others were fighting their own downward spirals. The next morning, David was gone. There was no note, no goodbye. Just an empty bottle and the ghost of a life we once shared. In the weeks that followed, I threw myself into my work at the community center. It was my lifeline, the one thing keeping me anchored in a world that felt like it was constantly shifting under my feet. And then, one ordinary day, everything changed. A woman walked into the center, her designer clothes and perfect makeup a stark contrast to the usual clientele. She introduced herself as Cassandra, a philanthropist interested in supporting our work. But as she spoke, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about her. Her eyes were too calculating, her smile too sharp. And when she mentioned David's name, a cold dread settled in my stomach. I hear your husband has been having some... Trouble, she said, her voice dripping with false sympathy. I stiffened, my guard up. David is no longer my concern. Cassandra's smile widened. Oh, but I think he might be. You see, he's gotten himself involved in something quite dangerous, and I have a feeling it's going to come crashing down on him very soon. I didn't know what to say, what to feel. Was this karma finally catching up to David? And if so, why did it feel like another blow to my already battered heart? As Cassandra left, her perfume lingering in the air, I realized that our story was far from over. David's downward spiral was pulling us all in, and I wasn't sure how much longer I could keep swimming against the current. But one thing was clear. I had to keep fighting. For my kids, for the people who relied on me at the center, and for myself. Because if I gave up now, David's betrayal would have truly broken us. And I wasn't about to let that happen. While I was building a new life for my children and myself, David was unraveling at the seams. His guilt over our lost home and his inability to face our reality drove him into the arms of a dubious crowd. And at the center of this crowd was Cassandra, a woman as manipulative as she was charming. It wasn't long before I heard about David's new association. Rumors reached me at the community center, whispers of David's late-night escapades and reckless behavior. But what really caught my attention was Cassandra's name, always mentioned alongside David's. One day, while organizing a food drive at the center, I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. Reluctantly, I answered, only to hear David's voice, strained and desperate. Ava, he began, his voice trembling. I've made a terrible mistake. What is it, David? What have you done now? My voice was weary, bracing for yet another blow. It's... 
It's Cassandra. She convinced me to invest in a business venture. It was supposed to turn our fortunes around. There was a pause, and then he added in a barely audible whisper. I used the last of our savings. I felt a cold wave of disbelief wash over me. You did what? David, how could you be so reckless? He was crying now, his sobs crackling over the phone. I thought I could fix everything. But it was a scam, Eva. The police are involved now. The news hit me like a physical blow. Not only had David betrayed our family by selling our home, but he'd now gambled away the last of our financial security. I can't fix this for you, David, I said, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside me. You need to face the consequences of your actions. The call ended with David's pleas echoing in my ears, but my decision was firm. I couldn't drown in his mistakes. I had two children who depended on me, and a community that had become my second family. As weeks passed, David's situation worsened. The scam he'd been lured into was unraveling, and with it, any semblance of his life. Cassandra had disappeared, unsurprisingly, leaving David to face the legal repercussions alone. One evening, as I was locking up the center, Lily approached me with a concerned look. Ava, there's something you should know. What is it, Lily? I asked, a sense of foreboding settling over me. It's about David. He's been arrested. The scam he was involved in was bigger than anyone thought. He's facing serious charges. The news should have shaken me, but all I felt was a sad resignation. David, once the love of my life, had become a stranger, his path diverging so far from mine that I hardly recognized him anymore. Thanks for letting me know, Lily, I said, my voice calm. But that's a chapter of my life I've closed. David's downfall was a stark contrast to the life I was building. The next morning, as I prepared breakfast for my kids, I looked at their faces, so much like their father's, and made a silent vow. I would give them the stability and love they deserved, no matter what it took. My phone rang, breaking the morning quiet. It was the police, wanting to discuss David's case with me. As I listened to the officer's formal tone, explaining the legalities and the possibility of prison time for David, I realized how far removed I felt from the man he had become. Thank you, officer. I'll cooperate in any way I can, I replied, the finality in my voice marking the end of an era. David's unraveling was his own doing, and while a part of me would always care for the man he once was, I couldn't allow his mistakes to define my future, or that of our children. As I hung up the phone, I felt a sense of closure. My journey had been one of transformation, of finding strength in the face of adversity. The days turned into weeks, and my life at the community center became my stronghold. It was during this time that I heard the news about Mr. Grayson planning to demolish more homes in our community for his luxury condos. I started organizing a campaign. Save our homes. It wasn't just about fighting for bricks and mortar. It was about preserving the memories and the sanctity of what we call home. The campaign quickly gained momentum, with volunteers, local news, and even some prominent figures in the community joining in. One evening, during a campaign meeting at the center, Lily approached me with a folder in her hands. Eva, you need to see this. It's about Grayson. She handed me the folder, and as I flipped through it, my eyes widened in shock. It was filled with documents, reports, and evidence of Grayson's illegal activities and shady dealings. This was the break we needed to bring him down. Meanwhile, David's world was crumbling. Cassandra had left him, taking with her the last of his money. He was alone, facing the harsh consequences of his actions. I heard about his plight, but by then, I was too far removed from the person who once would have rushed to his aid. One day, as I was leaving the community center, David was there, waiting for me. He looked broken, a shadow of the man he once was. Eva, he said, his voice hoarse. I'm sorry. I never meant for things to go this far. I looked at him, the man I once loved, now a stranger. David, you chose your path. I can't erase the past, nor can I ignore the pain you caused. Eva, please. I need help. You need to help yourself, David. I have my own life now, one that doesn't include you. With those final words, I walked away, leaving David standing alone. It was a moment of closure, of turning a painful chapter in my life. The campaign against Grayson continued to grow, gaining national attention. The evidence we had uncovered was undeniable, leading to a legal investigation into his dealings. 
the development plans were halted, and Grayson found himself entangled in legal battles that would eventually lead to his downfall. I looked at my children. They were happy, and so was I. We had found a new place to call home. Not just a physical space, but a community. A sense of belonging. As I looked towards the future, I knew there would be challenges, but I also knew that I had the strength to face them. I had found my voice, my purpose, and no one could take that away from me. And that brings us to the end of Eva's story of resilience and karma. Now, I have a question for you all. Do you think Eva made the right decision in choosing not to help David at the end, even after everything they had been through together? Was her choice a form of self-preservation or a lack of compassion? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and let's have a conversation about it. If you enjoyed this story and want to hear more like it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more content. Your support means the world to us and helps us bring you more stories that matter. Thank you for watching.